Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 9 of my series on the murder of Inga Lotz. On today's episode, I'm going to explore what Fred's motive could have been if he was indeed the person that murdered Inga. And considering that his fingerprint was found on the DVD holder, I would say this is quite a legitimate assumption. Now, it's not possible for me to tell you exactly what the motive could have been. Only he knows. But based on all the available information, I'm able to make some informed and considered assumptions, and I can offer some speculation to support my relevant deductions. And much of the information presented here today were drawn from statements made to the police and private detectives by people that knew Fred and Inge. Some of these statements were made in the form of affidavits, otherwise others were just interviews. Some of the information was tested in court, some weren't. So I just want everyone to be cautious as we move ahead keeping in mind that a lot of what I will be presenting today is opinion and conjecture. And I'm just trying to paint a picture from all the dots that this information presents to us. Now to explore a possible motive, we need to start right at the crime scene. Firstly, the murder was planned. Preparations were made it was not the result of an uncontrolled outburst of anger. Secondly, the brutality of the crime indicates that the murderer felt extreme anger and hatred towards Inge. Thirdly, the arrow carved on Inge's stomach pointing towards a pubic area in, is indicative that the motive had certain sexual undertones. Now, Fred indicated that he was always under the impression that Inga was a virgin. Now, given that Fred has lied on many occasions, I'm not going to take his word for it. I'm not going to accept that as a fact. We know that the autopsy report indicated that Inga's hymen wasn't intact. And we also know there are many reasons why this could be uh, not related to sex. The issue of Inga's virginity seemed to have been a very sensitive issue to Fred. For example, when it was revealed in court later that Inga's hymen wasn't intact, Fred cried. We must understand that virginity was a very big deal to the Orthodox Pentecostal Protestant Church that Fred belonged to, the His People Church, today known as Every Nation. Fred was a very devout follower of the church, and some people even used the word obsessed. Now, to understand the importance of virginity to the Orthodox Pentecostal churches in particular, we need to understand the concept of a blood covenant. In basic terms, a covenant speaks of when two or more people come together and commit to one another to do something special. A blood covenant is the strongest type of covenant there is, and it involves either the shedding or the intermingling of blood. I'm sure all of you have heard of the term blood brother, where two men swear an oath to each other by undertaking a blood oath, where each person makes a small cut, usually in their hands, and then these two cuts are pressed together for the blood to intermingle. Now in the Bible, Blood covenants were formed between God and his people through, for example, the sacrifice of animals. David and Jonathan were blood brothers who formed the blood covenant by cutting themselves and intermingling their blood. The shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross is seen as a blood covenant between God and his people. In the same vein, marriage is considered the blood covenant where the shedding of blood is achieved when the woman's hymen breaks during the consummation of a marriage. And it is believed that God designed a woman's hymen for this exact covenant purpose. 
Now, only for the sake of exploring a possible motive, we are going to assume that Inga was indeed physically intimate with one or more of her previous boyfriends. And as we proceed, you will see that this assumption fits best with some of the things Fred said about Inga and his behavior that ultimately ended with the murder and the carving of the arrow. Now, even if Inga was not a virgin, that's really not relevant and it's none of anyone's business, and certainly not the business of the church and its pastors. Now, personally, I think the arrow is equivalent of a branding. Now, in the old days, for example, people were branded, marks were burned onto various body parts to shame and punish them for their sins and wrongdoings, permanently and publicly. Similarly, was Inga branded in this way to let people know that the murderer thought that she was a slut, a whore, or a promiscuous woman. So let's start off by looking at what Fred knew about Inga's relationship history. And this is from a sworn statement by Marius Boerter. Amongst others, we discussed how Inga behaved with previous boyfriends. For example, that she would start the relationship with a new boyfriend, whilst he was in a, steady, in a steady relationship with someone else. And then Wimpy Bottle said in another sworn statement, but that he felt that she had to get over her previous relationships. I thought he was referring to the manner in which Inge behaved in previous relationships must change so that their relationship doesn't end like Inge's previous relationships. And then he goes on to say, I can't remember the date, but at some stage Inga told me that she told Fred about each one of her previous relationships. And that Fred discussed their relationship with the people at the His People Church. And because of Fred's commitment to the church, I believe that the church's views and relationships will determine the course of their relationship. So here we can see that Fred knew about each one of Inga's previous relationships. She told him about she told him about all of them. He also knew that Inge would start a relationship with the new boyfriend whilst he was still in a relationship with her previous boyfriend. So whether all of this was true or not is not the issue here. It's about what Fred believes to be true and how he would react to that. Now on one occasion, Fred told Marius that Inge must renounce. But this has assumed that Fred wanted Inge to renounce the previous relationships and the behavior within these relationships. And we're going to come back to this a bit later. So one Saturday, shortly before her murder, Marius spent the day at Swellendam kite surfing. His original plan was to stay in Swellendam that evening. But he changed his mind and he returned to his flat in Pinelands. When he got there, back to his flat, he was surprised to find Fred and Inge on a fold-out bed under a blanket watching television. He was surprised to find them there because usually they would spend the weekend at Inge's home in Dalkenburg. Similarly, Fred and Inge were caught by surprise as they did not expect Marius to be there that evening that Marius sensed that they needed some privacy. He left the flat to go and visit Bram Kruger and Jan Minnar, who also lived in the same complex. And when Marius returned later, Inga was still there. In fact, she stayed over that night, uh, probably sleeping on the fold-out bed. By the next morning, Marius and Fred had a discussion about Fred's relationship with Inga. And Fred said that everything was going very well between them. And then Marius asked if they were still pure in their relationship, to which Fred answered in the affirmative. So that Marius so openly and unashamedly pried into the private business between Fred and Inge, was just indicative of how the His People Church invaded the privacy and the bedroom business of their members. For example, it, it came to my notice 
recently that a young married woman in the His People Church was grateful that she and her husband could be accountable to a pastor about their sex life. And then I also heard of a case where a married woman mentioned how she and her husband asked a pastor if they could use birth control. So during his discussion with Marius, Fred also talked about the biblical account of Hosea and the prostitute Gomer, and that he had also forgiven Inga like that. Now the Lord told Hosea to marry a promiscuous woman, a prostitute, and to have children with her. So Hosea married as a woman called Gomer, and she had three children, two of whom were likely not Hosea's because he had reverted back to her promiscuous ways. God then instructed Hosea to forgive her and to love her again. And Hosea then told Gomer, you are to live with me for many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. Is this how Fred saw Inga as a Gomer? a promiscuous and unfaithful woman that now needed his forgiveness. Although Inga may have innocent, innocently flirted with men, there is simply no evidence or any indication whatsoever that Inga was sleeping around while she was involved with Fred, and that she was unfaithful to Fred in the same way that Gomer was to Hosea. So my thought is that Fred was referring to Inga's assumed behavior with her previous boyfriends. Now Wimpy made a very interesting comment that he expected the course of Fred and Inga's relationship would be determined by the his people's views on relationships. What are these views? Now Marius explained to director uh, Ati Trollope that the church had very strict guidelines for relationships based on a very literal interpretation of the Bible. Firstly, the church believed in courtship as opposed to dating. With dating, you go out with as many people as possible and then you choose the best one for you. But with courtship, two people take the time to get to know each other while remaining pure, in other words, abstaining from sex. Secondly, you are supposed to treat your girlfriend like your sister. Physical contact should be kept to an absolute minimum in order to avoid sexual temptation. Thirdly, the girlfriend must be subservient to the boyfriend. And then lastly, if one partner has been in a previous sexual relationship, this must be confessed, it must be talked about, you must ask forgiveness from your previous partner, and this is called the breaking of soul ties. So breaking soul ties is about severing the tentacles of enslaving thoughts, emotional longings, and sexual bondages to those of your past or outside of your marriage. Spiritually, it's like cutting an umbilical cord and stopping the garbage that has been feeding you and keeping you connected to ungodly soul ties. Although Sexual soul ties are considered the strongest type of soul ties. They can also be formed by just emotional attachments to people. And sometimes these soul ties are good, and sometimes they're not. And the aim of the sanctification process is really to break all those soul ties that could hamper your relationship with a partner and your relationship with God. And the process is basically confess, repent, and renounce. And that is what's likely what was expected from Inga. Brett once told Marius that Inga must renounce. Now, I've seen on the internet that in order to renounce, sometimes they expect our people even to return gifts that they may have received from a previous partner or to destroy objects that belong to that person. As they believe that even those objects can tie you to those people. I don't know whether, in this particular case, Inga was expected to go to that extent. But we know that Fred and Inga's relationship was discussed with the people in the His People Church, and I assume that Inga's past relationships and the way forward 
for her to become part of the church and a suitable partner for Fred form part of what was discussed. In my opinion, there were at least two outcomes to these discussions. Firstly, Inge was placed under the wings of Sylvia Strauss, a senior member of the His People Church, and with whom Inge attended one-on-one -on -one Bible study sessions to work through the 12 chapters of the Purple Book. Secondly, Inge was asked through Fred and pressured by Fred to break soul ties, to sanctify, to renounce, to deal with her previous boyfriends, to apologize to them and to ask for forgiveness. Now we know that Inge reached out to at least two people, Marius Borta and John Minar. It's a bit strange as Inge was never in a relationship with Marius, but we know that he certainly had a crush on Inge at some point, and perhaps Inge felt bad that she may have hurt Marius at some stage when she did not reciprocate his feelings. This is from a sworn affidavit by Marius. On March 2, 2005, I received an SMS message from Inge. In the SMS, she touched on two main themes. The first was that she wanted to apologize for anything she had done to hurt our friendship in the past. The second was that she was busy growing in, in her relationship with God. I did not respond immediately as I didn't know what she was referring to. Later that evening, I sent her an SMS message wherein I encouraged her to keep growing in her spiritual life. When I now think back about the message, it's possible that Fred was pressuring her to sort out unresolved issues with friends. It was important for Fred that Inga not carry emotional baggage with her. I was, however, not aware of any unresolved issues between Inga and myself. On the same day, also March the 2nd, Inga sent a long text message to John Minna. And during the first year at university, it seems Jan had a brief interest in Inga. On an occasion, Inga told Wimpy that John was a good kisser. Later that evening of March the 2nd, John then called Inga back and they had a 10 minute conversation. Now, Inga's phone records show that by the time of her death, Inga did not make similar attempts to contact some of her previous boyfriends. For example, Bron Kruger, one of the boyfriends Inga was supposedly unfaithful to. Bram Kruger in his statements also made no mention that he was approached by Inga in the same way he approached Marius and John. Why was this? Was it perhaps because she ran out of time? Or that this, did she simply lose interest? Now we have previously alluded to the fact that Inga wasn't very comfortable in the His People Church and that she was likely just going through the motions to appease Fred. We know that she told the friend that she didn't like the happy clappy jumping up and down business that was going on in the church. Now let's look at the last Sunday of Inga's life, as recalled by her mother. So in spite of not feeling well, Inga woke up that morning with a headache. But she nonetheless decided that she would sing in the church that she grew up in, the Dutch Reformed Church in Valkenburg, which is outside Cape Town. Inga left early on her own to prepare and practice for the duet she was going to perform in church that day. And then Fred and Mrs. Lodge followed a little bit later at about nine, nine o'clock. So Inga performed a number of duets with a friend whose name was Tian. And after church, Inga stayed in the front and happily socialized with Dian and other church members. Fred got impatient with Inga because Inga wasn't joining him. Mrs. Lotz saw this and suggested that Fred go and join Inga, but Fred didn't want to. And when Inga finally joined them, Fred remained unresponsive to her and he just walked up ahead to the car. They then returned to the Lotz family home. Then at about four o'clock that afternoon, Inga and her mother started packing her clothes for a week while Fred looked on. When Inga asked 
how hot the upcoming week was going to be, Mrs. Lott said, very hot, and she then pulled out a short dress with thin straps. So after India folded the dress and placed it in the suitcase, uh, Fred got up from the bed he was lounging on and pulled the dress out and said, this dress you only wear when I'm with you. Inga and her mother just laughed, but Fred was very serious. About an hour later at five o'clock, Inga was ready to return to her flat. And after pulling her car from the garage, Fred asked if she would come to church by herself that evening. That would be to the His People Church in Stellenbosch, or if he should pick her up. Uh, Inga answered him, in fact, I'm never going back to that church. Fred did not appear pleased with what she said. After Inga left, Fred left and then went back to his flat and he did not go to church that evening. At seven o'clock that evening, uh, Inga called Fred and they spoke for two minutes. Six minutes later, Fred called back and they spoke for a minute. And then two minutes later, Fred called Inga back again and they spoke for three minutes. I don't want to make any inferences from this sequence about the sequence of calls, but I simply want to present the fact that they did talk that evening, and I imagine what Inga said earlier was discussed. A, a resolution must have been achieved and after text, after Inga received a text message from Fred, she sent the following text message back to him. Love you a lot as well. You are an unbelievable guy for me. and I'm grateful that you are in my life. Sleep well, all my love. Kiss, kiss, and hugs. And then on Tuesdays, you continue the Purple Book Bible Study Sessions with Sylvia Strauss. Now, I don't believe that Inga was serious about not going back to Fred's church again. She cared too much for him to do that. I think in the mood of the moment, she said something impulsive. Perhaps after having been to church that morning, she probably wasn't in the mood to go back to church again. But there's a saying in the Afrikaans language, but the heart van fall is loop die mond van oor. It basically means, out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. For Inga to have said that may have been indicative of something that she carried in her heart. Now what is very telling is that Fred denies that he, that Inga said this, about not wanting to go back to the church. And he said this much, in, and he said as much in court. Implying, therefore, that Mrs. Lott lied and perjured herself. Now, why would Mrs. Lott make something like this up? And this was also not the only instance where Fred denied something that Mrs. Lott testified to. There was, for example, the case where Fred told Mrs. Lott that he would become a child in the house. And this is after Mrs. Lott found out about Inga's death. And he said this repeatedly also in front of of Professor Lotz. Now the fact that Fred did not readily admit that Inga said this must be seen as meaningful and that it likely plays into the motive. Did Fred tend to realize what was really going on in Inga's heart, that she was not committed to the church as much as she thought she was, and that she therefore was not committed to God? and by deduction not to him. If it would have been important to Fred that Inga fully embraced the church and God the same way he did. And her failure to do so can be seen as a personal affront to him. Now one of Inga's friends, who also knew Fred very well, after being questioned by a private investigator, said the following, that this friend suspected that Inga tried to fit in with a very rigid Fred and that Inga did not pass the sanctification procedure and so in the process it also tainted Fred. Another good friend said that the His People Church bothered Inga but she was so excited about her and Fred's relationship. This friend had the impression that Fred was obsessed with the church and that it would have been unacceptable if Inga did not adapt to the church and adopt its dogma. Now one cannot talk about the motive and not talk about the letter that Inga 
wrote to Fred that morning. Well, there was an argument. It got heated. And Inga thought that the relationship might very well be over. And that is what she mentioned to Wimpy during their lunch meeting, that the relationship was over. I think not because Inga wanted it, but because she thought that that is what Fred might well decide. She still wanted to get engaged to Fred later that year or the next year. So this letter was a desperate attempt to appease Fred, to fix things and to get them back on track. Now appeasement and the definition of an appeasement is basically the process by which someone placates or pacifies another in a situation of potential or actual conflict. And in the process of appeasement, a person can display different types of behavior, apologetic, submissive, affiliative. Now let's look at the letter and I will show you these behaviors in action. Please note, I'm not a trained psychologist, nor a forensic ling linguist, etc. Please keep that in mind. These are solely my personal opinions, but I'm pretty sure you'll see that it makes a lot of sense. Dear Fred, this letter is going to be a bit more difficult than email. Count the lead and make changes over and over. But I must get, but I must get these little things off my chest this morning. So here we see self-deprecation, submissive behavior. She belittles her own issues, these little things. I get the impression that she did not want her problems, her issues, her worries, are ever significant than were to her to compete with those of Fred's. I think indirectly she wanted Fred to know that she acknowledges his problems and that he could feel and know her support. I'm sorry you left here this morning and confused. I was initially unreasonable and consequently the whole thing got out of control. Here Inga is starting to take responsibility for the argument. However, the use of the word initially makes me think that at least subconsciously she wasn't willing to take full responsibility. In fact, I would go as far as to say that in her heart, she didn't feel she was unreasonable at all. But for the sake of appeasement, she was willing to take it upon herself. And then she said that the whole thing got out of control. So at this point, what do we know about how serious the argument was? Well, she said things got out of control in her letter. She told Wimpy it was a hell of a fight. And she also told Wimpy that Fred left suddenly. Firstly, about you and your brothers. I pray that God will give you wisdom on how to handle the situation and that you will be able to resolve the issues between you. Remember, I'm always there if you want to talk and I very much want to be a part of your life and try to understand what you are going through. Now, as we move through this letter, please note the different tone in this paragraph compared with the other paragraphs. There's nothing apologetic or submissive in this paragraph. It is just straightforward supportive. Do I ever get the impression that Inge just wanted to deal with the topic of Fred's brothers and get it out of the way so she could move on to more important things? I don't get the impression that that Fred's issues with his brothers played a significant role in the argument which took place that evening and that morning. The little things that are bothering me at this time. I'm really sorry about the things I said this morning. My biggest mistake over recent times must have been to find my security and solution to my low self-esteem in you instead of in God. I haven't realized it up until now, but God has unbelievable ways to speak to one. And I now realize that I have been the unreasonable one and not you. The little things, being submissive, I'm truly sorry, being apologetic, my biggest mistake, being submissive, my low self-esteem, being submissive. And by speaking of God, adopting Fred's language, she's trying to show affiliation. And then Inge apologized for something she said that morning. 
And we must see this in light of what Fred told a private investigator a few days after the murder, that he had forgiven her for what she had said to him. So we can surmise that Inga said something really bad that was a personal affront to which Fred thought he needed to forgive Inga for. And then from the sentence, and I now realize that I have been an unreasonable one and not you, I get the impression that Inga at some point during the argument accused Fred of being unreasonable, and now she's making a reversal. And that it's that it was she who has been unreasonable and not Fred. And not to make it appear contrived and more authentic, she claims that she now received a revelation from God. She goes on to say, Further, I am extremely scared of the Easter weekend and that you will see my father when he had too much to drink. I don't want to lose you in such a way. I don't want to see, I don't want you to see that side of the family. The problems between Fred and his brother stemmed likely from that excessive use of alcohol at his brother Darby's wedding, where he re reprimanded them. So what I believe we have here is a desperate and a rather clumsy attempt by Inge to show affiliation with Fred. As Fred had concerns about his brother and alcohol, so did she have with her father. She wanted to stand shoulder to shoulder with Fred in this issue. But Inge's blind desperation is evident from the fact that this is completely irrational. That Easter weekend would not have been the first time that Fred spent a weekend with Inge and her parents at the holiday home in Witsand. Fred had already seen Inge's father enjoy wine during meals, and if it wasn't an issue then, why would it have been an issue now, or over the Easter weekend? It must sound silly, but it's really a big concern to me. And lastly, just usual little things, work, CT1, financial mathematics, um, I'm going to get a job, what am I going to do with my flat, etc, etc. Again, look at the submissive, self-deprecating tone. Sounds silly and little things. Sorry that I sometimes forget that you're only human. I look up to you so much and I have such great respect for you. Your opinion and the way you handle problems. I don't always realize that you also have bad days and hurt sometimes. I don't always know how to support you, and if you even need or want support. I don't understand how you handle hurt. You will have to teach me how to understand you and how to support you. Look at what Inga says about herself. I sometimes forget. I don't always realize. I don't always know. I don't understand. She's groveling. She's crawling on her knees before him, kissing his feet while elevating him. I look up to you so much. Great respect for you. The way you handle problems. You will have to teach me. I feel that I disappoint you. If I can't do the things I mentioned above and you, and you deserve to have a beautiful girlfriend who looks good, who can cook, and who is in all respects just as perfect as you are. I struggle sometimes to get there. Perhaps this is what is the most difficult for me. I know that you don't expect of me, but you must please show me how I can be the perfect girlfriend for you. Just look at this. I disappoint you. I can't do. I struggle. Difficult for me. And then about Fred, you deserve. As perfect as you are, you must please show me. I love you very much and I don't want to look any further. Tomorrow it will be one year since I fell in love with you. The first Wednesday afternoon that you alone came over and had coffee with me. And since that day, I have not doubted for one moment that it is you that I want. You have enriched my life in so many ways and every day with you is the greatest gift that anyone can dream of. To me, it's very interesting that the word very is in capital letters. Is she trying to convince Fred of her love after she had been accused of, 
or made to feel that she did not love him? Now for the last paragraph, Inge's closing argument, and which one can expect to be the most insightful. You need never have doubt again for one moment that I'm absolutely committed and that I want everything within me to be with you forever. I want to promise today that I will not depend on you for a good self-image and for security, but that I will take it to God that I will support you in everything that you do and that I will be absolutely honest with you about all aspects of my life. I can also promise you to today that I will, with God's grace, always remain faithful and that I will never do anything behind your back. Now, uh, the use of the word again is very telling. It means that Fred did at some time doubt Inga's commitment, and by using such phrases as absolutely, everything within me and forever, Inga was trying to placate and convince Fred that she will remain committed. And then Inga made a few promises. I will support you in everything I do. I will be absolutely honest about all aspects of my life. I will always remain faithful by God's grace. I will never do anything behind your back. Now, I get the sense that Fred questioned Inga's commitment and support because he thought that there were some things that Inga had done behind his back. Things that he either did not tell him about or had lied about. Hence the accusation of dishonesty. And Fred construed this as Inga being unfaithful or cheating on him. I believe that Inga did not agree with Fred's assessment of her actions, and she defended herself, and in the process accused Fred of being unreasonable. And perhaps in the heat of the argument, she said something that had an impact on Fred, something that he thought he needed to, to forgive Inga for. Hence Fred's comment to the private investigator that he had forgiven her for what she said to him. Now, what could Inge have done behind Fred's back that could have led to this argument that got out of control? Now, from Inge's phone records, it seems that she had been exchanging text messages with someone. And that person was not Vimpy. It was either a fellow student or someone she worked with at the university. The contact was not very frequent, certainly not to the intensity one would expect from two people who shared a romantic connection. These text messages could have been completely innocent and related to Inga's studies and work. There are, however, a few text messages that may be seen as suspicious, as these messages were sent late at night. For example, on Monday the 14th, two days before her murder, Inga sent three text messages to this person, and the last one was at 22.47. Unfortunately, Inga's phone records do not show incoming text messages, so we don't know how many and how frequently Inga receives text messages from this person. I'm by no means intimating that Inga was cheating on Fred with this person. As for Inga, it seemed perfectly fine for her to have male friends while being in a relationship. Just look at Wimpy, for example, a friendship that Fred tolerated because she knew it was purely platonic. But what if Fred didn't know about this friendship between Inga and this particular person. What if Inga did not tell Fred about him? And Fred somehow found out about him and confronted Inga. In Fred's mind, this could certainly have been construed as Inga keeping secrets from him and doing things behind his back. And perhaps some of the text messages were mildly flirtatious. Inga was known to be flirty. She may have ended some of her text messages with little X, the equivalent of pecking a cheek. In Inga's mind, this was completely innocent, while in Fred's mind, Inga's behavior could be tantamount to cheating. In court, uh, Ati Trollope testified that at least two friends of Inga told him that Fred was very jealous of Inga's flirty relationships with men. Apparently, in an SMS, to Fred, Inga told him that a kiss he gave Marius Butter once was innocent. 
Could the argument have been that Fred accused Inga of cheating and that she defended herself and told Fred that he was being unreasonable and that it escalated from there until Fred stormed out? Realizing that the relationship with Fred was in great peril, she wrote the letter to appease him. Remember how Inga told Wimpy that their relationship was over and that they had a hell of a fight? Well, I think she said that not because she wanted the relationship to be over, but because she thought that Fred was going to end the relationship. Thereafter, Inga expressed her own hopes for a relationship, that she wanted to get married. All of which ties in well with why she wrote the letter. Now we know that Fred was bothered by Inga's previous relationships and that he was nervous that he would become a victim as well. And then he was fully expecting Inga to sanctify and to, and to renounce and to make progress in joining the His People Church. And then in the middle of all of this, he caught her exchanging SMS messages with another man. Now, please don't be fooled by the friendly tone of the text messages that followed in between Fred's departure that morning up until the time that Inga gave him the long letter. It was Inga who started the text messages and as, he was, and as he was trying to appease Fred, of course the text messages would maintain a loving, positive tone. And as it is most likely by this time Fred already decided what he wanted to do that day, it would have been in his best interest to follow a similar tone so as to hide any evidence of anger. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I, I believe that at the core of this motive is how Fred saw Inga in light of her past relationship history and how she was dealing with it so that she could become the perfect partner for him. It is clear that her history was a concern and that it bothered him and he wanted her to renounce. It was discussed with the people in the His People Church and he then pressured her to resolve any issues with previous boyfriends, all in line with the teachings of the His People Church. However, it is likely that Fred came to realize that Inga had issues with the church per se and that the process that she was required to go through. We know from Inga that she wasn't too comfortable in the His People Church. It was like a shoe that's too tight. It causes blisters. And when Inga seemed to slow down and become less ent enthusiastic, Fred took that as a sign of a lack of commitment to him, to his relationship, to the church, and ultimately to God. And then something happened that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Fred discovered that Inga had done something behind his back, and he saw it as an act of cheating and unfaithfulness. And this is what the argument was about. Inga didn't think that she had done anything wrong and accused Fred of being unreasonable. And the fact that she did this while she was supposed to sanctify herself only added fuel to the fire. Although Inga tried to reverse the damage by taking full responsibility as per her letter and saying that she received insights from God, Fred did not forgive her. And he let his jealousy, his desire to control her, and his anger get the better of him. Now, why would a seemingly upstanding Christian like Fred, who knew perfectly well that to commit murder is a sin, do something like this? Now, this is a very complex question, and I don't really want to speculate too much about it. But what I do want to say is that psychologically, we are all different. We are the unique product of our genetic makeup, about the physical, social, family, and religious environments that we grew up with and we now find ourselves. Like everyone else in life, there are outliers, people who are psychologically dysfunctional. There are people who, for whatever reason, are unable to regulate their emotions and to control their anger and hatred with sometimes fatal consequences. Now in Fred's case, we know that Fred's mother wrote him a letter on September the 6th, 2004, in which he apologized for certain, for certain things that happened in the family in the past. 
spread the latest letter from his computer at 9.30 that evening of the 16th, about an hour before Inga's body was found. He deleted this letter from his computer. The police managed to find it, retrieve this letter and other documents he deleted. And because the content of this letter was going to be so embarrassing to the, from the paper family, the defense made a deal with the state whereby the state would not use the letter in court. We also know that Director Ati Tollop was investigating reports that in high school Fred received treatment and psychological counseling to deal with anger issues. We also know that on the last weekend together Inga, Inga's mother observed unusual bruises on Inga's arms and asked Inga if Fred had been hitting her. Inga just brushed it off and answered, what's mom talking about? Then she left the room and returned a while later, dressed in a shirt that covered the bruises. There was no outright denial. A private investigator also uncovered information of Fred assaulting Inga in one of the university residences. And of Inga arriving at the residence one day with bruises, looking very upset. After she admitted that Fred assaulted her, she begged them not to tell her mother or to let her mother find out about it. Now, this is information I have drawn directly from the investigator's report. I've not been able to independently verify it, but I have no reason to believe that the investigator would present false information or that these people would have given the investigator false information. He also provided the name of at least one person who could corroborate some of the information. Now, if you add to this potent stew of psychological dysfunction, the ingredient of distorted religious beliefs, things can turn very toxic very quickly. And here we're not talking just about any church, but about the teaching and practices of a particular church that relies on a very literal interpretation of the Bible, especially when it comes to sex and relationships. And that furthermore, under the guise of sanctification and shepherding, takes an active interest in these aspects of the members' lives, past, present, and future. Now, avoiding, escaping, and combating sin are all key tenets of the Christian faith. The Bible talks about putting sin to death, fighting and eradicating evil, equipped by God for the task. Obviously, this is meant figuratively through repentance, seeking forgiveness, accepting God's grace, and then living a life without sin. But sometimes people are so focused on combating sin that they lose sight of love, empathy, and compassion. And then in the Old Testament, there are plenty of instances commanding the literal killing of adulterous women. The biblical Old Testament ideas of fighting sin, evil, and punishing immoral women, etc., can easily be used by someone on the right combination of psychological dysfunction, social influences, misguided dogma, and a misinterpretation of the Bible to justify a killing. That they're doing God's work as many people have done throughout history and will continue to do in the future. I'm not saying that the His People Church support the literal killing of sinners, nor that they condone it. But unknowingly, in this case, a loaded rifle was placed in the hands of a toddler. I'm going to leave it at that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure I've left you with lots to think about. In my next episode, I will talk about the hammer and why I believe that the hammer found in Fred's vehicle was the hammer used in the attack on Inga. Until then, stay well. Thank you.